Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to today's webinar on encouraging responsible behaviours in woods and green space, which is being jointly hosted by Community Woodlands Association and Community Land Scotland. Um, for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm John Hollingdale, CEO of the CWA. Behind the scenes, we've got Christina and Meg from Community Land Scotland who are making sure everything runs smoothly. So if you do have any issues during um, the event, then please contact them either through the chat function at the, that you'll get at the bottom of the screen, or um, if you're out of the call, then by email. And um, I'm sure they'll get you back and connected as soon as possible. Um, I'm just going to start the meeting with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we're running it as a webinar, so only the speakers will be visible on screen or audible. Um, during the event, we're kind of encouraging you to ask questions because we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. Um, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions and I'll try and um, pick them all up in that discussion time at the end. If there are any particular points of clarification for a speaker, I'll do that at the end of their presentation. Uh, as you probably heard when you joined, we are recording the session and both CLS and CWA will be making it available on our respective YouTube and Vimeo sites and we'll produce a brief report um, so you can catch up on any links or any details on the presentations that you miss. Um, you'll be able to catch up with as soon as we get those reports up and ready. Um, before I introduce our speakers today, I just wanted to say a few words of sort of general interruption because today's topic area, responsible behaviour and its counterpoint, antisocial behaviour, are often pitched um, as a really big negative. And we wanted to put a little bit of a positive spin on it. I've been working with and supporting community groups, owning and managing woodlands for over 20 years now, which is a bit scary even as and of itself. But one of the biggest concerns we find with almost all new groups is about antisocial behavior, vandalism, drinking dens, fly tipping, et cetera, et cetera. And I wouldn't want to pretend that it doesn't happen or that it isn't an issue, or, and that dealing with the consequences can be stressful and challenging, especially for volunteers. But in my experience, it happens much less often and on a much smaller scale than, than people worry about or fear at the beginning of the process. The reality is the vast majority of woodland and green space users are very responsible, and most of the feedback and issues that, that we get from groups are about annoying but possibly lower level issues, particularly litter and dog mess. So in general, we think it's clearly an issue that groups need to, to wrestle with. And there are no easy answers to how to make things that much better. But fundamentally, we believe that education and encouraging positive behaviours is the way forward. So on that note, I'm going to shut up and I'm going to start introducing the uh, speakers, the first of whom is Mark Perry from the View Park Conservation Group, who recently acquired about 65 hectares of the View Park Glen in North Lanarkshire. So over to you, Mark. Hi, everyone. Um, so just a quick kind of background of myself and my site. I arrived here probably about six months ago. The site historically has been considered it's kind of been dead space. It's this lovely bit of green land uh, that is sandwiched between uh, the motorway and uh, a large housing development or two housing developments. And because of its placement, it has been a place that people have maybe uh, gravitated to, not necessarily uh, for just enjoyment of the woodlands, but it's a dead bit of ground that unfortunately has seen misuse in terms of dumping, uh, dumping of waste, uh, fly tipping in particular, um, also littering, uh, household litter, waste, unfortunately, the houses that back onto the property, um, a lot of waste uh, comes down the hill there. And it's also been a place that has seen um, uh, quad bikers and off-roaders uh, gravitate towards it because it is this kind of dead ground. Um, unfortunately, uh, that has caused uh, many issues over the years with uh, the, the, the local walkers and people who want to use it just as a walking site. And over recent months, or particularly over the last couple of years with the COVID restrictions, 
people who have been coming out and finding the site have started uh, hitting up against those who have been, as I see it, misusing the site uh, or using it in a way that has been uh, disrespectful to other users. So basically, I arrived on the scene maybe about yeah five months ago now, and was very quickly brought up to speed with the situation. Last year was a very bad year for the guys here. Uh, they've only been in control, the group that I work for, of the property for the last two years. And unfortunately, that has fallen entirely uh, through the COVID restrictions. So work has been fairly limited and restricted. Uh, last year, however, um, lots of people were obviously trying to get outdoors. And because the initial demographic was this off-roading community, um, and uh, this, this community who was uh, doing a lot of waste uh, camping on the ground, that increased uh, tenfold, unfortunately. Um, what then started to happen, uh, this was before my time, my colleagues started to speak to uh, members of the police and others to try and discourage uh, the presence of these quad bikers because the site was now changing in terms of its use and their intended plans for the site. Uh, what I did when I arrived, I made it very clear that to evict of those groups or those users straight off was going to cause a real issue in terms of clashing with them uh, and you would see increases in vandalism and negativity towards the work that we were trying to do. So what I tried to encourage was a uh, an approach that was far more relaxed a more gentle approach uh, to, to bringing this kind back to the people, to the walkers, uh, dog walkers and cyclists. Basically, that was improving the access across the site in such a way that was welcoming those users onto footpaths that they may not have been familiar with in the past, but doing it in such a way that other means of vehicle uh, access, um, so in terms of some of the gates and some of the other areas which these quads were bring in, would no longer be appealing uh, to those user groups. Now, it's, it's a very difficult situation because um, in my role as a ranger, you want as many people to be using these routes as possible. Um, but unfortunately, we were getting to a point where we were having um, severe issues with um, Mrs. Um, families out for walks. And then you'd have motorbikes um, thundering down a very narrow path. And we had some very close calls. So it was definitely in my interest to try and restrict um, access to, to these user groups. And as I said, I did it in quite a gentle way, which was opening up the pass and welcoming people onto them whilst subtly discouraging others. And it seems to have been having a good effect. Um, a lot of the users who were coming here for off-roading um, were doing it in a legal sense. Um, and they very quickly um, started to go in other directions, especially when the police started to show more of a presence. The ones who were maybe um, just here by word of mouth, um, they were able to communicate with myself off the back of the work that I was doing and uh, they were very on board with how we were trying to change the site for the better. Um, in effect, it was essentially by reintroducing the park to those people who used to use it and restructuring the footpaths and the access routes through them. Uh, we started to put a fine stamp on it. Oh, someone says they can't hear a lot of what I'm saying. Uh, is that everyone or just? Or just this is... um, hi, Mark. Yeah, it seems to be restricted. potentially your connection, but I wonder if maybe if you if you speak closer to where the mic is, maybe it would work. Do you want to? Try that. Sorry, guys. Unfortunately, the connection this end is very poor. Uh, we've been having issues uh, with our line for a time. Um, I'll just try and uh, keep going. And I apologize if you can't hear uh, what I'm saying or if it's intermittent. Uh, I, I am very much in the process of wrapping up because I will be coming to the end of my time shortly. Um, but basically, the approach to antisocial behavior on our site, which has mainly been around this uh, off roading presence and the waste dumping. We dealt with the off-roading presence by welcoming the users onto the site. Uh, we're welcoming people into the site who uh, are here to walk, who are here to take their dog out, cyclists, runners. By making the routes and the paths more accessible to those users and clearly signposting, uh, we've been able to encourage uh, 
uh, a change in how the site has been used. And that has both made this not the type of site that maybe these off-roaders who wanted a bit of dead ground with not many people on, it's discouraged them from coming. But it's also shown the community that this is a green space site that is uh, here for, for more than just one group. Uh, and that's been really important. And although we're not trying to uh, create a negative dialogue with the with the off-roading community, we're trying to say that this is the normal place for what they wanted to use it for. And the same as we can be said of the, of the waste dumping as well. Now that we have a presence, an active presence and a volunteer presence, um, we are finding that waste dumping has become far less. Uh, we're also as well seeing more of a presence with uh, some of the, the wider community now that COVID restrictions are lifting. Um, so council members, uh, members of the services are coming in who are, are helping with us uh, to both deal with some of the issues that have been present here and have kind of been ignored. Uh, it has been a ground that has been ignored for, for too long, um, but hopefully with the work that I've been doing and the work of the group, uh, we're really starting to see a change. Uh, and I have to say, within the short months I've been here, five, six months, uh, I'm really seeing a difference. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, so that's helpful. I hope that um, most people caught most of that. Uh, it was at times a little bit um, difficult to hear because of the internet connection, but um, if there are particular questions or clarifications, um, we can pick them up perhaps in the, in the Q&A session uh, later on, if that's all right. Um, we're going to move on and our second speaker is Adrian Clark from Evanton Wood Community Company. Uh, Evanton Wood Community Company acquired their woodlands, um, also about 64, 65 hectares, I think, about nine years ago. So they've had quite a lot of experience of managing that wood over the years now. Uh, so I am a volunteer with uh, the community wood in Evanton, which is a lovely mature woodland just behind the village, which we bought 10 years ago. So celebrations next year. And um, from the start, we've been very involved with the community. It was already well used by the community before we purchased it. So that hasn't been a problem. Um, however, we have broadened the use um, to involve all ages, uh, both from the, the local and further afield. So involving schools and nurseries was some, one of the first things that we did. And uh, here actually you see a picture of, of our very first um, day of, of community ownership. Those girls at the front, they are now volunteers in the wood, nine years on, which is fantastic. And most of the people in the picture are involved in one way or another, even today. Next, please. Um, so access for all is, is our key note, is our, is our operating theme really. So whatever we do, we try to make it welcoming, um, whether it's in structures that we put up, like in the play area, um, like the cabin that we've built, the seating and the signage. Um, we've used uh, artwork from the children uh, that you'll see in a, in the next slide, uh, but the other things that we've that we like to do um, is just to show our presence, make our presence known when we're in the in the woods. We've got an active board. We've got other volunteers who will often speak to visitors. We get a lot of visitors through the um, Walk Highland uh, website and booklets that are pointing people towards the Black Rock Gorge. And to get there, if they come from the Edmonton village, they have to go through the wood. So it's an opportunity to um, tell people what we're all about. Um, so we encourage a sense of belonging, not just for local folk, but um, people who come from far and wide. 
Um, any equipment that we make, we try to make as sturdy as possible and reinforce it as necessary. And you'll see some pictures of this later on. Um, security is an issue that we've had to grapple with um, on occasion. Uh, it's not something that we have any definite answers to, but it's sort of, we're still trying and testing things as we go along. Next, please. <clears throat> So vandalism, yes, it, it does happen. We've been fortunate over the last year, and I don't know if that is um, because of COVID or because of the extra um, the, the, the extra work that we've put in to ensure safety and security, or whether it's um, just uh, the community um, self-policing to, to a large extent, more people looking after the wood, more youngsters who may be part of a, a drinking party, you know, telling their friends, you know, to really value this asset, which is on their doorstep. But we've had have had to deal with it on occasions. Drinking party is the same thing. <clears throat> John mentioned dog poo and bags. That is an ongoing issue. We find that actually uh, the, the poo bags are as much an issue as the, the poo itself. It's always curious um, to me and other people to, to see people going to the bother of bagging the, the dog poo and then just leaving it for other people to take away. Litter is something that um, we, we are blessed with, um, you know, people being pretty responsible about, but um, for, unfortunately, some people do not read notices and they, they insist on putting their um, barbecue stuff into our litter bins. Now, the litter bins, we don't have a a collection so anything put in our bins has to be taken down into the village and put into our own personal bins so um, we have to empty those occasionally but actually it hasn't been a, a, a big issue. Uh, vehicles um, I'm reminded actually by Mark there that um, we did have some problems with motorbikes in the early days I'm talking 10 years ago but I think in the last six years, six or seven years, we haven't seen a single motorbike in, in the woods. I think that's probably because motorbikers are put off by, if they see those walkers and other people really having, you know, using the routes and they're not going to feel comfortable uh, zooming along those routes anyway. We discourage uh, vehicles from coming into the woods, <clears throat> uh, as do the um, people who live nearby. Um, because we, they would pass right in front of their gates and we occasionally get complaints if um, vehicles are going too fast in front of them. Now, we do allow disabled uh, and other people with mobility problems to use the small parking area and um, that is used sensibly. Uh, we haven't had to um, implement any of the, any, any more draconian measures uh, we did discuss that a few years ago when there were more complaints from the from the from the neighbours, but um, things have calmed down, and um, people are now reading the signs. Albeit the council did actually agree to put up a sign saying restricted access, so that was good. <clears throat> um, fires in the wood. Well, currently we are discouraging all fires actually, um, although maybe now it's getting a bit wetter again today. Um, that won't be an issue. Uh, we do have three or four wheel rims at different places in the wood for people to actually make the fires and they are generally well respected. Um, and we haven't, there was one little fire some years ago, I think it was probably somebody um, letting go of a, of a cigarette butt just by the farmer's field, uh, but it went out very quickly. Um, use of our toilets. Well, over the last year, we decided, um, unlike some other facilities, we decided to open up our um, composting toilet 24-7, rather than just for events and activities and, and people booking. And that has actually been a very good thing, because it means that families can now use the play area <clears throat> and feel comfortable. They don't have to rush off when Kitty needs um, to do a poo. Um, so, and it has been well looked after. We, we do keep it clean. We have um, a volunteer, Deirdre, who's very insistent on cleaning it several times a week. 
And um, we did have a bit of an issue with disappearing loo rolls. And you'll see a slide of that just shortly. Um, but I think we've got a, that under control. <clears throat> and we do have some neighborly issues regarding things that are left on our side of the fence. And that, that can be slightly problem problematic because it's, it's hard to sometimes, it's difficult to speak to people from, from your own community who you think are, you know, maybe bending the rules a bit. Can I have the next slide, please? One of the things we did from the start was to involve the children um, in artwork that um, enable them to feel more part of the wood, but also we've, we've used their artwork to good effect in many guises subsequently. So on to the next picture. <clears throat> um, this was the first art project they did with Lizzie McDougall, and we've used a lot of those images in our publicity since. Uh, so that is a little marker within the wood that, you know, th this wood belongs to the children and, and, and everybody as well as um, uh, drinking parties and, 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 and whoever. So I think it sort of sets a little, um, it, it's a nice welcoming reminder for everybody. Next, please. Uh, so there you see one of the badges on the right, uh, along with an orienteering um, sign. We've got about uh, 15 of those around the wood. Uh, so we go to Friendly Field through the uh, boards um, and also through the sculptures that we have through the wood. And all of them have been well respected as well. And the next. Um, welcome signs um, done by local uh, volunteer wood carver and sort of friendly signs that we um, put up and tend, tend, tend to be left um, untouched, fortunately. Uh, we try not to put up too many signs, but we've got three or four places that we can put them on boards. And next. Um, so the first composting toilet, uh, we've just opened our second one actually, but the first one, which we open all the time, yeah, has been very well looked after, very well used, apart from disappearing toilet rolls. Um, and that has actually improved in recent months anyway. And the next. Um, involving teenagers, uh, mainly through schools programs has been an ongoing thing with us. We've worked uh, mainly with Dingwall Academy over the last uh, eight or nine years. We've also worked with Tain and Allness Academy. So any work you do with, with teenagers is bound to have a, um, an impact on how other teenagers use it or how they might use it over a weekend. I've seen some of the, the kids coming back to camp, others with family members walking around the woods and showing it off and showing off the work that they have done in it. And the next. And the, the first cabin that we built was, is, is sturdy. It is actually just a, a, a covered porter cabin. So it's um, not easily accessible. Albeit we did uh, have some vandalism a couple of years ago that we have since had to deal with uh, by putting on shutters uh, to the front window there. You see in this picture and you'll see in a subsequent one as well. And the next. So yes, we've had mindless damage on for probably half a dozen occasions. This was one of the worst ones. The, the window has been uh, smashed a couple of times and you know, wooden benches and so on overturned um, after drinking parties. We do call the police when that happens. We always report it and they do their best, but to date they haven't actually come back to us with any positive identification. But I think that's what they tell, tell us. But I think it's quite likely that they have spoken to a number of potential culprits or uh, connections and the word gets around that you know the police are on the case. So I think it is important to, to report um, instances of, of vandalism to the police and let them deal with it. And the next. Uh, so that's just, I think that's the same or, um, yeah, that's the same incident actually there. Uh, these round tables were donated to us by uh, Pass for All. Um, they're easier to access and the, the square ones um, evidently easy enough to overturn with, actually that's not true. It takes about three people to overturn one of those. 
Um, and the next, uh, so we've put on the shutters onto the um, onto the glass window. Um, that was a volunteer who did that for us. Uh, we can slide those or fold those back when we need to use the cabin. We have put on up a, a CCTV camera. When I took that picture just a couple of days ago, I noticed that the camera was actually pointing downwards towards the ground. Somebody had managed to um, push it backwards. Uh, so it, uh, yes, I don't know if they did that with a rock or managed to somehow climb up there. So I've rectified that on the long ladder. Um, I, I'm not allowed to tell you this, but it is actually just a mock uh, camera. So, um, but it, it sort of looks the part. And we also have a wildlife camera sometimes in the middle um, marker there. And then we have a, um, a solar uh, motion sensitive light at the bottom. And I think these extra security measures are helping. And the next, we also have CCTV signs. As I say, it's not a live CCTV, but um, I think that probably at least discourages some, some bad behavior. Some people will disregard it, but um, I mean, you have to put it up if you have a, a real CCTV camera. So, you know, it's, it's um, we sort of part way there. We don't want to go down the route of actually having a, a live camera if we can help it, but um, we'll see how things pan out in the next year after COVID and the next. Uh, we've actually ensured that these picnic benches are not turned over by putting long stakes into the ground and then uh, ropes around the base there. Okay, it'd be easy enough to cut the ropes, but um, it's going to discourage any sort of mindless vandalism. Yes, next. Um, so I mentioned the, the, the fires around the, the wheel rims. Um, and that's, you know, where we encourage people to make fires and that's, that's where they do make fires and it's fine. Um, in the play area, everything is sturdily built and we just make sure we look after it. We haven't noticed any mindless damage in the play area, fortunately. Occasionally things rot and we have to replace them and you just have to keep on top of that. And the next. Um, we encourage um, families, children, teenagers to build their own structures. Um, if, if, if we deem them to be unsafe, then we'll take them down. Some will leave there for a few weeks and then we'll take them down and allow the next group to, to build them up again. <clears throat> um, we had the support of the community payback team, that's people doing community service to actually build uh, this play area. So that was a win-win a for, for the whole community. And we found that the community service offenders really enjoyed working in the wood. And the next. Um, in addition to the clad cabin, we, uh, we have a, a sturdy tool cabin as well, just below it, partly hidden. We have a sturdy um, water trough with the mains water supplied from just 20 meters away. And, um, and we built a number of um, nice benches. Well, actually, it was a chainsaw carver, Ian, Ian Chalmers, who's made us some lovely carved benches that you see right through the wood. And the next. So how best to deal with, with some of these issues? Youth gatherings, well, we're, fortunately, I live just down the road. Well, it's mainly fortunately. You don't always want to get called out to say that the, you know, the youth are having a party, but sometimes it's um, <clears throat> people maybe being over, over worried about um, the fact they've seen some youngsters going up into the, into the woods on a Saturday evening. But we appreciate people keeping us in the loop. And, and when we receive that sort of information, we do tend to go up. I, I tend to go up with a friend of mine. And just um, if we find the youngsters early on in the evening, we ask them to be sensible. Sometimes we get a call later and then we have to go up again and just speak to them. And occasionally we have had to call the police, but that is a, a rarity. We do find that the personal approach generally seems to work. And what works even better than that is uh, their own peer group telling folk to, to be sensible. 
some some youngsters come back on the Saturday, Sunday morning to clear up after after the detritus of the night before, which we appreciate. Um, and others just smash their bottles and and they couldn't care less. So it's that it, there's no obvious answer to to those who um, are going to refuse to you know be sociable. But but as I say, that is a minority. Uh, Dog poo with us has, has improved in recent months. Uh, we've put up a few extra signs. Um, I don't know whether these things go in cycles or what, and whether we'll see a whole plethora next year, but things are under control. Dealing with neighbors. If you're dealing with neighbors, um, from personal experience, I would say, always have another committee member with you. So it's you're not just taking it on, on yourself or you know, taking on your own neck to maybe get a few words of abuse from, from somebody. But when vandalism happens, is it do we do we publicize it? Well, we have done. We haven't always done, but if it's a if it's a serious um, issue, then we do put it up on Facebook. And I have to say that Facebook does tend to get a lot more views for for the negative stories than for the positive ones. We would normally get about a thousand to fifteen hundred views for our our regular stories, and and up to seven to ten thousand for the for the ones regarding vandalism. I don't know if people just uh, are more inclined to click on bad news. But if you really want to get news on Facebook, you say, we have found a, an iPhone in the woods, and then you get 20,000 clicks. Um, so on from that, access and use. Well, we, we now have a, 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 an access and use policy, which is on our website, which sort of takes into consideration all these things I've mentioned before. And um, it's something for the, the board members to update and for them to feel comfortable with. Recently, we've <clears throat> been discussing uh, bookings by by other by political and religious groups, well, political groups in particular, and we uh, have an agreed policy on that now. With regard to policing our bookings, um, yeah, it's a it's a softly softly approach. Um, sometimes you do have to have a word with people, but you know you try not to be too too in their face and just uh, try and keep them on side. And the next. Um, so yeah, the wood is a place for everybody to enjoy. This is the second structure that we put up and opened two years ago. We couldn't use it much last year, but we've been having a series of concerts this year. So that's a wide range of people who come along. And that's it. Our final slide is of the opening of the shelter just uh, two years ago. And then just um, as, a, as an extra, I've got one from the uh, Glasgow Canal that I visited just at the weekend. And um, I don't know if that's a sort of uh, notice that we might consider putting up in the wood. Um, it's what they are using on the canal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian. Yeah, it seems like a lot longer than two years ago that that uh, was at the opening of your um, new shelter, but I'm glad to hear it's being used this year well. Um, we're going to hand over now, I'm going to introduce uh, you and Thomas from the VAT Run, who manage about seven hectares, I think, of land, which is owned by Edinburgh Council at South Queen's Ferry, just under the old Fourth Road Bridge. So over to you, Ewan. Great. Um, and good afternoon, everybody else. So, um, as John said, my name's Ewan Thomas. So um, I've been leading the VAT Run project from the very beginning, which is uh, probably about 12 years or so now. Um, and I'm going to tell you as succinctly as I can anyway, some of the about some of the behavioural issues that we faced on site during our time and some of the ways that we've tried to, to tackle them. And um, I'll just give you a brief overview of the project um, before I start. Um, as John says, the VAT run small woodland project in South Queensferry, so just outside Edinburgh and quite literally under the fourth road bridge. Essentially, it's a brownfield site that's of leftover land from when the Navy were based there during the Second World War. Later on, it was the site of building yards for the bridge construction became a picnic site after that and then kind of fell into to disuse. 
Um, it is pretty small compared to the the other sites we've seen today. You know, so seven hectares, about five hectares of that is woodland, and then the rest's a mix of habitats, uh, predominantly meadows, but with some ponds in there as well. Um, and over the years that we've been working there, we've now built about one and a half kilometres of paths and mountain bike trails, um, as well as a bike pump track, an outdoor classroom, um, some viewpoints, and a couple of fire pits, amongst other things. And then, uh, just in case you're wondering about the name, the VAT run, it comes from the fact that right next to the site used to be the VAT 69 whiskey bottling plant. I mean, it's long since gone now, but I, I believe they do still produce fat 69 whiskey but yeah they yet to donate to us and um, so the entirety of the project has been undertaken by volunteers although when the project was at its busiest you know i was working there as a park ranger for edinburgh council and i'll admit here that you know i think having a paid was one of the crucial factors in developing pro the project and in the, the kind of future success of the project. And we brought out a huge range of volunteers to help out, um, including corporate groups, skill training groups, as well as sort of local volunteers from Queen's Ferry itself. And, you know, when the place was really going like a fair, we were putting in over 3,000 volunteer hours a year. And I think the biggest group we had was about a hundred or in fact over a hundred uh, corporate volunteers from RBS. So use of the site, it's kind of developed over, t over the time we've been working there. Um, in the early days, certainly when the bike trails were new, we were attracting quite a number of bikers and of all different ages, to be honest. And, you know, they've more or less stayed with us, you know, as a group, if not necessarily the individuals. And as time's gone on and the site's matured, and also as more people have found out about the place, the kind of use of the place has started to change. And we've seen kind of nursery groups in particular making use of the site. Most recently, you know, a forest kindergarten group's been established on the site, and they're now there five days a week, mornings and afternoons, and you know, they're loving it. So, I think it's fair to say that when when we first started working on the site, we inherited a whole bunch of issues that had long been associated with the place. Although kind of earlier in its history, the site had been subject to some interest by local environmentalists. For the most part, it was a pretty unwel unwelcoming place. I mean, it was heavily overgrown, you know, and I think jungle would probably be the word to describe it. Also came with a history of antisocial behaviour. You know, I'd been told that, you know, generations of fairy folk had learned to drink there. And there is more buckfast than VAT 69, judging by the evidence. And fire raising was also quite a popular pastime. Um, there was a considerable problem with current and historic fly tipping too. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to look at the anti issues of antisocial behaviour for now. So kind of given the intimidating nature of antisocial behaviour, I, I did make a decision at the beginning that I wasn't going to go and try and tackle it head on. I didn't have the time, skills or resources at that point. And put, instead, I kind of planned to plow on with just doing the work that we we're wanting to do and hopefully, you know, letting the site change the, the behaviour of the people to some degree. I mean, and this is hindsight talking now, but I think that approach which allowed for contacts with, with the culprits. I mean, if, if you want to call them culprits, you know, it, that, that kind of approach allowed us kind of, we, we were able to develop a much more sort of organic contact with, with, the, with the people that were misusing the site. And it, it certainly was an approach that worked for me. Um, I'll not go into the, the full story on the pictures here, but as you can see, they're kind of more or less like a short storyboard of one of the incidents that we dealt with early on and kindly presented by the main players themselves who took to social media to proudly show off their fire-making skills. 
names and faces have been removed to protect the guilty. The upshot of, of this little story was that a parent of one of the children who'd been involved in you know, volunteering with us passed on the Instagram post that the boys had put up. I passed that on to the police and we'd developed quite a good relationship with them by that time. Although kind of no legal action was taken and it's not something we were looking for and I don't think the police had that kind of time. You know, the boys did get, you know, the police chapping on their door wanting a, a wee word with them. And that word gets around quite quickly as well. So the approach that we took to dealing with the problems that we had took several different forms. Um, one part of it was we accepted that perhaps we weren't going to ever get completely rid of the problem. And so we would kind of try and roll with the punches a little bit and maybe encourage them to perhaps change their own behavior. So one of the first things we did was uh, go in and improve the sight lines throughout the site by removing much of the undergrowth, um, thinning, crown lifting the trees, although this did have the consequence of creating much more material to burn, but it was, it was just the chance that we took on that. Um, but clearing through the place did kind of remove a lot of the hiding places and the secret corners that made made the place feel unsafe. And I think I really noticed the uh, word about the place spread quite rapidly through the, the dog walking population. Kind of another perhaps risky step, you know, was creating a couple of fire pits on the site, you know, encouraging rather than discouraging the making of fires, but kind of limiting the size of the fire pit. We were kind of dictating the size of the fire that they could have. And it also had the, the advantage of focusing the problem into areas where we could manage it. And it, you know, it also helped the police know, know where to look as well. Um, and it's at it's this kind of point that we branched off into two kind of almost slightly, slightly different, but, you know, still connected courses. And on one route, we were looking to sort of tackle the present and immediate issues. But and then on the other hand, we were looking to influence the next generation of young people. So we kind of started to make our presence much more well known locally. Um, following that, you know, we, we, the networks and the contacts followed on. So I, I'd got to know uh, the local youth workers, teachers, other movers and shakers within the community who had direct contact with some of the young people using our site. And we devised a number of programs to engage and connect young people with the site but without making accusations or calling them out on things. I mean, it was more, much more of a kind of soft power approach, I guess. But at the same time, I was starting to do um, a lot more work with the local primary schools and the, the nurseries doing forest school activity days, stuff like that. But what I was kind of really aiming for was to get those, those primary children particularly to create a physical impact on the site, you know, things like planting trees or building dead hedges or building high vernacular, things like that. Things that, you know, they could see, they could touch, they could show to their parents. And, you know, the other advantage to this was quite often that those children had older siblings at high school. And, you know, I was particularly looking to make those kind of connections, a kind of reverse peer pressure if you will. So, you know, as time went on and as we got busier on site, it wasn't so easy for the, the kind of young ones to hang out on site and misuse it, cause bother. They kind of knew that somebody would be around somewhere. And, you know, the levels of antisocial behaviour, particularly the fire raising, did definitely dwindle. I mean, I'm not saying we got rid of it altogether and, you know, we kind of never expected to, but when something did happen, we generally knew or could find out quite quickly, you know, who was behind it. And we also had the volunteer availability to restore any damage quite quickly. It's kind of 
I suppose akin to the the broken window policy that they, they had in New York once upon a time. Uh, and at the same time, kind of word of mouth was was getting around amongst families and dog walkers, and also amongst the the schools and nurseries. So that you know there was beginning to be this real kind of increase in positive users as well. I, th I think what was perhaps the sort of thing that proved the point was um, during lockdown was you know when all the work on site stopped. And it was kind of clear once we did start getting back on site again, you know, a year, year and a half of inaction and the bad behaviour had started creeping back in again. You know, and I'll, I'll admit at this point, you know, there's been a kind of change in circumstances lately, which means we don't have um, anyone paid on site for any amounts of time anymore. And so it, it's kind of is quite hard to pick up that kind of momentum again that, that we originally had. So, I mean, if I was to trying to summarize what worked for us or what's successful, you know, using my amazing powers of hindsight, I would probably say that having a regular, relatable, identifiable presence on the site made the world of difference. And I think that was probably the most crucial factor in in the whole thing and i think that's what really tipped the balance but also kind of being able to show constant changes and improvements to the site you know that it made it clear that, that people were working there and people cared for the place and it wasn't simply the land of do as you please so these improvements i mean the improvements in installations that we put in you know they needed to be pretty robust and bomb proof and you know we did we did learn the hard way but you know we've we've built quite a few things out of wood there that do which do still stand but you know stone is is definitely much much harder to burn um, and the last takeaway i think would be to not take it personally i mean i i from any damage and misbehavior that, that would go on However, you know, I think I soon came to realise that, you know, while there was no excuse for the actions, most of the, the young people who were involved, were, you know, they were actually not malicious, but sort of merely expending their energy in uncoordinated ways. So, and anyway, in, in the end, I think, you know, I have learned to be as resilient as the, the wood I'm looking after. So... Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, you and, and um, yeah, thank you, all three speakers. And I think that final point of the don't take it personally is, is one of the hardest things to, to deal with. And I remember from my own career years ago, managing the community woodland, it was very difficult not to do that and to step away and not regard every piece of litter or damage as being a slight against me, but just a problem for the people who were doing it. Um, I'd, I'd invite you and Mark and, and Adrian to kind of turn your cameras back on and your, your mics back on and um, I've got two or three questions, I guess, to, to ask that, that, that come out of that. And, and from my own experience, um, some of the I think a couple of you mentioned um, was your kind of experience through COVID and one of the things that we've um, heard from other groups certainly some other groups have, a, have experienced a great increase in footfall during the, the COVID 18 months I guess that it's been going on now and a whole new set of users um, it's not just the same people coming more often, it's a whole set of new people, a lot of whom have to be kind of, if you like, freshly educated in the ways of the countryside or the ways of green space, because they're just completely unfamiliar with, with accessing the countryside. Um, is that something that you feel that you've been dealing with in, in your respective sites? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's definitely the case. You know, there's been 
very obviously an increase in in footfall positive and negative you know i mean i think on the whole the positive has definitely sort of won out but we've definitely kind of suffered from a break in the kind of continuity of certainly of, of involving young people in it that that we've really you know we have really felt and there has been a step back towards you know chucking the aerosols cans back on the fire and this sort of nonsense so you know it, it's and yeah trying to get that momentum back again after the covid i think is going to be a, a challenge yeah yeah i mean on, on that note um in terms of covid i mean as i said the guys who uh, i work for the charity of, uh, the organization i work for Although they've been going 21 years, they only actually achieved the buyout of this site two years ago, just as COVID was hitting. Um, and because of that, obviously the restrictions in our workload have been very uh, have been limited. Um, but in terms of the actual use of the site, it's been huge. I mean, essentially the site has been discovered because of COVID. Before then, it was a few locals who used it. Um, which obviously then spawned into this, this off-roading presence um, and that grew in its, in its own right. However, in terms of a walking site and, and a site to enjoy as a woodland, for being a woodland, it's, it's really in this last two years um, that, that people have discovered the site. And that has been, if anything, the biggest positive thing for us is without it, we would probably be in a very different place, a place where we would still be having um, you know, discussions and arguments with, with people who were both misusing the site. Okay, you've gone very quiet again, Mark, sorry. Oh, have I? Sorry. I think I just keep yeah. bringing it out. Anyway, sorry, someone, someone else jump in. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I would say that from our point of view in Evanston Wood, um, after the initial lockdowns, when people were pretty scared to, to go out, um, some months later, we did see a, a marked increase in the use of the family areas, the play area, picnic area, and so on. And a lot of people have said to us, you know, what a boon the space has been for them over, over the lockdown, because it's deemed by them to be a, a relatively, um, well, a very accessible local space with, without, um, you know, the, the concerns they might have elsewhere. So we've, um, as I mentioned earlier, taken the decision to keep our toilet open during that period when others were, were closing theirs. It has meant extra cleaning and so on, but um, I think it's been to everybody's benefit. We haven't actually seen additional vandalism during during COVID. Um, fewer youth parties than, than might normally have happened. So I'm, I'm not sure whether that's because they have been, you know, warned by their parents and others not to, not to gather whether they've been sensible or whether there's other reasons for it. Yeah, okay. Um, one, one thing that all three of you mentioned in, in some respect or other was, was the necessity in some cases of getting the police involved. And I know that some of our member groups sometimes say it's quite difficult to get the police to get involved. And even this is clearly illegal behavior, they see it as a kind of low priority and not something that's an easy solution an easily solved case, but clearly you've managed to invite you all about how you build relationships with the police and, and, and get them to take you seriously. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so in terms of the police at our site, one of the interesting things was, and before the last two years happened, our site was in a way a good out for where to send people who were off-roading and uh, you know doing that kind of thing on the streets uh, so ultimately that's where a lot of our off-roading traffic came from it was an encouragement to say please don't do it down the street go to that bit of empty land uh, over there and that's essentially how the problem kind of originated um, however since the people moving back into the site the police have started to be taking more of an active presence they realized that there was definitely an off-roading issue um, and through conservation sorry conversations with ourselves we've managed to 
bring the police on side, especially the community police officers who end up uh, cycling through the, the estate now. Um, and they've also carried out a couple of um, sting operations to essentially arrest and uh, confiscate um, some of the, uh, the off-roading vehicles. Um, it's worth noting that the off-roading that does happen here is illegal off-roading. We're talking very unsafe, um, unregistered vehicles, um, so actions that do, unfortunately, and have resulted in um, death and damage to the individuals involved and others. Um, so the police have definitely been um, more inclined to take an active presence now. So there was there was an element of us communicating with them, but they were very aware that now we were here and now we were improving the access to the site, uh, they would need to take uh, more of a stance against the off-roading. Thank you, Mark. And uh, we've had no problem at all in, in phoning the police and they come out, um, you know, with, within half an hour generally in the all nesting area. Um, the, the youth parties that we get are a movable feast. You know, they, they go from town to town within a sort of 10, 15 mile radius. So the, the police would be well aware of the, the, the main individuals involved. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for myself, I made a lot of contacts with the senior community police officers. And there was a police officer based in the local high school that we'd have quite a good relationship with and you know quite a sort of informal chat with him would quite often enable him to have a have a word around the school and things like that I mean they would tend not to turn up on site unless you know their kids were breaking into the marina and damaging boats I mean you know we did I was kind of of the understanding that you know a small fire in the woods is not a big problem but Early on, we, we did kind of have a couple of fires where the fire brigade came out and then that encouraged a bit more action from the police. And also by sort of the constant reporting, they're able to sort of build up a picture of, you know, what the situation was on the site. And it, I mean, to be honest, it also helped that the receptionist at the local police station used to volunteer with us as well. So I'd pop down and have a word with her she would chat to the kind of other officers and it quite often were, you know, on a bit of who you know type of basis, but it kind of, it worked, it, you know, it really kind of, it did help suppress a lot of the worst of it. And, you know, you, you'd quite occasionally see the kids starburst through the park when the police turn up. So it's, um, yeah, it's kind of tried not yeah. to get the police too involved, but. And as you, as I think a couple of you said, you know, if what they do is have a quiet word mm -hmm. and that deters people, then that's, that achieves what you want rather than sort of feeling that you're bringing charges for every yeah. minor infraction. It's, mm -hmm. it's also probably in the long term improves your community relations um, doing it that way. Uh, it was obvious from what all three of you were saying that the kind of the people solutions are fundamental to this, to, to making connections with people, but also um, a couple of you talked, you know, there are design solutions that help as well, and particularly the building things sturdier, um, building things as solid as you possibly can and as vandal proof is clearly the way. But I was interested in the kind of the creating the fire pits in order to make sure that these things happen in a safe place. Um, and I think both Adrian and Ewan said that had seemed to work, that if you actually create the facility, people do the thing that you don't want them to do everywhere in the one place where you can make it safe. And I think that's a kind of a key learning from this. That yeah, I mean, you need it, to talk to people, it, but the design works. Reduces the area of damage, reduces the area you have to litter pick as well, because they tend to just, you know, chuck mm -hmm. the litter around the fire and then, you know, you don't have to go trail through to find the stuff and it, it's kind of any you know as a kid I did love a fire and I don't want you know kids now to sort of not have the pleasure of doing that you know and it's and through the kind of particularly forest school with the primary schools 
you know, we did kind of teach them how to make fires properly. And I would quite often find some of the forest school kids making a little fire down there by themselves and, you know, work to treat, you know, it's, it's just catching the next ones coming through. That's going to be. Yeah. There was a, a point you made, Ewan, about the kind of woodland management solutions as well, that if you open sight lines and you make it feel safer, yeah. then, then it's harder for people to hide away and do bad things, but also it encourages many more people to come in the woods. And perhaps that also discourages yeah. the, the near-do-wells if there's a much yeah, I mean, greater uh, uh, full yeah, that was something I picked up working in urban parks was kind of clearing through sight lines so that you're not rounding a corner, not knowing what you're going to come across. And as well as sort of benefiting the woodland and allowing more light to the to the woodland floor and things like that, it does, it just makes the place feel more open. It, you know, you can see where you're going. You can see that there's nobody hiding and reversely, you know, it's, there's nowhere to hide, you know, they can't kind of yeah. get up to no good where you can't see them kind of thing. And I, I, yeah, that really worked. I think it was the first, the first thing we did was, was, you know, crown lift, you know, thin out and remove the, un most of the undergrowth. Anyway. Yeah. Right, Mark, Adrian, any thoughts on that? Was that, obviously Adrian, you've been there a bit longer, so you have more chance to. Uh, well, I mean, that's something that we've been doing as, as part of our woodland management plan anyway, doing the thinning out and creating yeah, sight lines in the process. And certainly the views that you get through the wood are much improved now. Um, we're also encouraging people actually to go off track and ex explore some of these new spaces that we have carved out. So we're, we're quite relaxed about people making the most of every little area within the wood. We, we as volunteers know it pretty well. So um, we're, we're, we're in the wood at least, you know, three or four times a wood a, a week. And uh, we can always check and see if any damage has been made or, or there are walkers most of the time who will, you know, tell us if there is any untoward action. They'll even tell us about fires that were, well, there were some fires about four weeks ago during the very dry period. Um, and as a result of, of that, we actually did put up notices telling people not to make fires for, for the time being. Um, but yeah, it's a mixture of, of woodland management plus um, public access. Unfortunately, the two sort of go hand in hand. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, for me, as I said, like, I, I focused um, or I've been focusing on the off-roading uh, presence, mainly to do with the fact that over the last you know, few months, our emphasis has been the access. So in terms of opening up routes and just making them clearer, um, that's kind of been what we've been doing for, for, these, for these months. Um, it's made it easier to encourage people to explore and, and very much like what you were saying in terms of you open up a route and make people feel more comfortable They'll, they'll go in and they will explore more um, and by bringing the people who we want in the woodlands and you know I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm trying to discourage certain demographics from coming out and enjoying the spaces unfortunately we're just in a position where the site isn't big enough to accommodate everyone so by making the routes welcoming um, to the walkers and the cyclists and and people who aren't on motorized vehicles um, has really has really helped um, put, put our site back on the map for for, for some of the local communities. So, yeah. Thanks, um, Christina. I was going to check that we don't have any outstanding questions that have come from the audience. If there is anybody listening who would, has a question that they would like to ask their panelists, um, please type it now or let us know as soon as possible. We've not seen any uh, questions come through on the Q&A. However, there's a few things that I just want to make sure people have seen in the chat that there's a real strong endorsement of the positive approach as opposed to a punitive approach, which seems to be echoed throughout the comments there. Yeah, no, there's very good feedback. And thank you for, for that from those who've made it. I mean, it, did, it does strike me that really the key thing 
is to recognize that community ownership is so much more than than a kind of legal status or tenure and it's that sense of community ownership of of having people who are proud of their um woods and green space that's really at the heart of kind of imp improving and encouraging that access and that that's something that it strikes me that obviously Everton and the Rat Run have been doing it for a lot longer so they've had more chance to do it but it does demonstrate how that happens that as people become more aware that this is their space and it's something that they value um, you get that concomitant improvement in um, behaviour and although as you and I said you can't ever expect it to be perfect and it, and it never will be um, it gets better and better the more you do um, so I think on that point I will probably thank all of my all of the three panelists um, thank you very much for your presentations and your answers to um, my questions um, thank you to everybody else who's contributed during the chat um, as we've said, the full seminar will be available on YouTube and we'll produce a brief report. Um, so, and that won't be very long. Everybody who's been on the seminar will get notified that it's, you know, once the, the video is, has been edited and processed and, and uploaded. Um, thank you everybody for joining. I'm just gonna finish by um, sharing my screen at the moment. Um, this has been one of a number of events. It's one that um, CWA and Community Land Scotland have worked together to develop and, and host. Um, but we have ongoing events um, for CWA. We have our annual conference the first weekend in October, uh, to which booking is now open. It will have it was a blended event. Have site visits from Carbridge on the Friday and online workshops on the Saturday, and then we'll have developing a series of events and that the following kind of four or five months. Um, I won't read them all out, um, and there may be one or two others coming up as well. So visit our website at communitywoods.org for details of all of those. And then Community Land Scotland, hosting Community Land Week from, let's say, 9th to 17th of October, which has a particular focus on the communities who've bought acquired their land during the kind of COVID period since March 2020. Um, again, full details on the CLS website. Um, because we're recording this, you know, these, if you haven't scribbled down the um, web links straight away, you'll be able to get them off the recording uh, when it's ready. And the CLS will also be hosting, delivering a range of training events in the future. So um, if you enjoyed this one, um, and I hope you all did and found it informative, then hopefully you'll join us for, for future events. Um, on that note, I'm going to say thank you very much to everybody uh, who's contributed um, and joined us. And I'll close the event and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank right. you very much. Yeah. Yes. Cheerio.